Hey coaches, today I want to talk about playing time. Not only is playing time important to our players, but it's also important to the parents that are in the stands. Now I know a lot of you are probably thinking, I don't talk to parents about playing time at all. And I want to challenge you on that just a little bit. You have reasons why you don't play a particular player, why you didn't put them in a situation, why you didn't have them guard a, a certain opponent, or maybe they just don't play very much in general because their skill set isn't there. Whatever the reason is, you have one. Most parents, when they come in, that's what they want to talk about. So I kind of challenge you a little bit to opening up that, that discussion on playing time. It's not so much a matter of your opinion against their opinion as it is, I'm going to tell you why your son isn't playing or your daughter isn't playing, and that way you know where I'm coming from. Now hopefully you've done a good job of meeting with players and letting them know this ahead of time, but sometimes the parents want to come in and they want to talk about it just the same. I'll give you one example here. I had a player uh, a couple years ago whose parent wanted to come in because the player just hadn't been practicing well. I talked to the player on two different occasions about their effort and practice and about what they needed to do uh, to make sure they turned things around. It came up to our next game and having two bad practices, I thought that gave another player who happened to be an underclassman the opportunity to start. Well, the parent and the player didn't quite see it the same way. They kind of saw it as once you're a starter, you're always a starter. Where I want it to be a competition where you're going out and you're earning that spot. So we sat down. I laid out the reasons uh, for the player having a bad practice. A lot of it had to do with energy, attitude, their demeanor, and things that I thought weren't helping the team get to the next level and to build. The player who was able to come in, the underclassman who ended up starting, was one who came in with high energy, communicated well, did everything you asked, was really trying to earn that spot, and I thought won the spot out. So we didn't see eye to eye, but it was a discussion that I was willing to have. And part of that is we have an administration, we have an athletic director who supports that competitive culture and supports the coaches in making the decision on who plays, how much they play, that kind of thing. So I had reasons, and I was willing to discuss those to a point and let them know exactly what it was that I was seeing and why I made the decision. The key was that I had already talked to the athlete though. If your athlete doesn't play very much because they just aren't very skilled or if they don't play very often because they had a bad practice, they missed a practice, they broke a rule, that needs to be known to the athlete so they don't go home and say, I don't know what coach wants to do. Now we aren't going to be perfect in our communication and not we're going to be perfect in conveying everything every single time. We don't have time to meet with all of our players a day before a game or after a practice. But keeping that communication line open really helps. But there are three things that I have found that help our players understand exactly where they stand and why they're playing or not playing, along with the parents understanding why their son or daughter isn't playing or not playing. So the first one has to do with stats. Now we use a program that gives us a VPS score. It's gonna be a value point score. So the value point score, a lot of, if you're doing any kind of analytics at all, a lot of programs already come up with this and it's, it's determined for you, it's calculated for you. But I did have a middle school coach who asked me, how do I you know, give these kids a clear picture as to who's doing better or worse or where they stand in things other than just saying, this is what I'm seeing. And I appreciated the coach's comment on that in his question because sometimes it's just, as a coach, you're saying, this is what I'm seeing you do, but the athlete isn't seeing it the same way, and they're a bit confused, or the parent can be a bit confused. Well, the value point score takes us all into account. This particular coach didn't have a, a system or a program to use on a computer, so they were calculating this by hand after the games. Not super hard to do, but you do have to have somebody keep your stats pretty accurately in order to get that. So if you're not familiar with the value point score, you can do it by hand, but if you're using any type of analytics program at all, it probably kicks a score out for you already. But basically what you have is you're going to take your points plus your rebounds plus and then this is where it gets kind of interesting. You're going to take two times the other good things that happens. So an assist, a charge, any steals they get, and any blocks they have. 
So all of that is kind of the positive things that happen in a game. We want to go and we're going to divide that by some of the negative things that happen in a game. First is going to be our free throw misses. And we're going to add to two times our field goal misses. And then we also want to add in here our fouls and our turnovers. So we take all the good things, we divide it by the bad things, and we come out to a score. Now, in our program for the varsity players, we like to try to keep our VPS score somewhere around a 1.0. That's what we tell players that we're shooting for. It sometimes gets higher in a particular game, sometimes it's a little bit lower, but a 1.0 is kind of the average that everybody is shooting for. In a middle school game, I'd have to follow up with the coach, but I told him that I think a middle school is probably going to be a little bit less than this. You might be down into that 0.7 range, 0.75 range, and find that that would be your top score because there's so many moving pieces. There's so many turnovers sometimes and missed shots because of the skill level of the players. So it might take a little bit to figure out exactly what works in a younger program, but for a high school program, we're looking at 1.0 uh, individually. So why do I bring this up to the players? First, it encompasses... A lot of good and a lot of bad. It's not just based on your points and your rebounds and your assist, which most players and parents look at right away. We want to look at everything you're doing in the game. So you score 12 points, you get 5 rebounds, but then we take a look and you scored 12 points on 20 shots. So you had a lot of missed field goals. You missed 4 free throws, uh, so you're 0 for 4 from the line. Maybe you got all 5 fouls, you fouled out of the game, and you had 3 turnovers. Your score is not going to be that great because... Your points and your rebounds didn't equal the same as what your uh, all those negative things that happened did. So we bring this up, we talk about it with our players, and we say, you guys know what your score is after every game. And after three or four games in the season, we have a pretty good average of what your score is. Now, when I look at this for my players, I don't look at it all season long. When we're in game 15... I hope they're playing better. So I tend to look at the last three to five games every time I look at it. Beginning of the season, it's the last three games. As we get more games in, I might go to five games and get an average score. That helps me determine who's helping our team the most and who is hurting them. So we talk about this as a team. They know what we're looking at. They can get to this information, and then they can go and they can convey that to their parents if they want. But this is a number that I bring up quite often when I talk to parents because I'm Usually, my intuition and what I'm thinking is that this player, if player one, is better than player two. Then I go to the VPS score, and there's not too many times where I'm wrong, where player one has a better VPS score than player two does, and that backs up what I'm doing. Uh, the opposite is true, though. I get challenged sometimes. I go in there and say, well, I thought player one was better, but man, their last three games, they aren't playing better. Player two is playing better. I need to look at that, and I need to see if I need to make an adjustment. All of the playing time is not based on this solely. I think you have to look at attitude, you have to look at effort, you have to look at hustle plays, things like that, that aren't measured here. But this is a great place to start, and it takes it out of what's my opinion versus what do the numbers say. Players and parents both have an easier time digesting it once they know what these are. I had one meeting with a parent where the parent came in with points, rebounds, and assists and turnovers because their son happened to be a point guard. That was great, but that didn't account for field goal misses, free throw misses, fouls, and different things like that. So their numbers didn't match up with mine, and they didn't reflect the number uh, that I was looking at. So something that you want to kind of teach your parents about, and sometimes it doesn't happen until you have the meeting with them, but if you let your players know right away, they know what to look for, and that can head off some things with some parents. The second way that I have my players and my parents kind of get on the same page with me is by taking the players in the beginning of the season, and we kind of do a heads-down, hands-up thing. And I explain to my players there are two options, all right? The first option is that I play everybody equal minutes, so I divide up the 32 minutes in a high school game by how many players we have, and you all get to play. We'll see how it goes, but everybody's going to get on the floor. You're all going to have an opportunity to do what we practice, and then the win and loss record is what it is. The second option is that you trust me to substitute the, the way that I think is best for us to win the game, put us in the best situation to win, and that may mean some of you don't play, some of you don't play very much, and others of you may play a lot. Uh, but 
either way, this is going to be a team decision, and whatever we go with, that's what we're going to live with for the season. Now, I've never had a team vote to actually do the 50-50 playing time, so everybody's got equal playing time, and we see where the wins and losses are. It's always a unanimous, we want to win. And I get that, especially at the varsity level. Now, doing this with the middle school players might be a little more difficult because they're getting into their first rounds of competition and having those school colors on their jerseys. Uh, so it may not work quite as well with those kids because they don't have as much at stake as what a varsity player has. But I ask them, put their heads down, raise your hand, and we go over those two options again. Once we have the countdown and we know exactly uh, what the numbers are, have them put their hands down, they raise their heads up, and then all of a sudden I talk about, all right, this is what the team has decided. Now we need to know when we leave here, when we walk out this door, we go to practice, you go home, that as a team you've decided that you want to try to win every game and you're going to trust that I will put you in the best position to do that. So that means when your parents complain, when your friends complain, when you're feeling down about something, doesn't mean that we can't have a discussion about it, but we're not going to beat up the fact that coach isn't playing me, that coach isn't doing this or that. You need to come have a discussion, but we said it's not equal playing time. This is going to be, coach is going to put us in the best position to win based upon the players he thinks that are going to be able to do that in a game. That has helped head off a lot of conversations I think with parents. I ask the players to go home, tell your parents this is what we decided as a team, and then come back ready to work tomorrow or if we're going out to practice let's go work and then I remind them at the end of practice about what we decided. Uh, and I, not so much that I think the parents go home and they just tell or the players go home to their parents and they just tell them this is what we decided, you know, you can't complain, you can't do anything. I don't think that's it at all. But I think you get the frame of mind from the player that we want to win coach is going to do the best we can. I can still come talk to him about my playing time, but complaining about it is not going to get me anywhere. So I think we kind of start that conversation, get that feeling off right away. The third way, and this tends to happen a little bit more as we get into the season and a pecking order is decided. So you might even be after your first couple of scrimmages, or maybe you're into a couple of games and you're kind of deciding who your top seven, eight, nine players are, and you know who your bottom players are. So what I do here is we talk before practice about what it is to be a good teammate. And we talk about what it is to be a cancerous teammate. And cancers tend to grow. They affect the, the cells around them and they multiply. And I said, one thing you have to be really careful with is you've got to be careful going into the locker room when coach isn't around and thinking that I'm going to complain to the guy who sits to my left. And he's going to sit there and he's probably going to listen because he's a nice guy. But you're going to do that and you're going to make sure that he hears every word that you say. And since he didn't say anything back, you're thinking, well, he agrees with me. That player right there, he agrees with me. So now I've got an alliance. It's me and this guy. We're together. We both are on the same page. When that player next to you may not really agree with you, but they're nice, they're being respectful, they're listening. So I challenge those players that were sitting to the left. You've got to give them two options. Either, hey, you know, if you feel that way, you need to talk to coach. Or, you know what, you need to play better and earn that spot. And sometimes that can be hard for a teammate to do. But a lot of times it's go talk to coach. Go to, I hear him say that. I'll walk in the locker room and you got to talk to coach. And I don't get involved with it. I let those guys decide when they want to come in and talk to me. But they know that the door is open. They can come in and talk to me whenever they'd like. Then we continue on and we talk about when you think you've got one person on your side, what are you going to do next? Well, you're going to go to another person and you're gonna to try to get them on your side. And then you're gonna to go to another one, just like a cancer, you're gonna to try to grow it. So a team of 12 players, you've got two people, one on your right and one on your left, who you think agree with you. And maybe they do, maybe they don't, but you believe that they do. So now it's three people against the other nine and we've created a division. So we have to be really careful not to create a division amongst our team. The best teams I've coached, the championship caliber teams that are talking about conference championships, regional championships, and making a run in the tournament, those are the teams that are together. If we have a divide on this team, I'm sorry, but we're not going to have an opportunity to be as good as we possibly could and to meet the goals that you may have for this team and for yourself. So those are three ways that I talk with my players and get their minds in the right spot. So now when they go home, 
They know what the VPS score is. They know how we voted for playing time. And now they're thinking about, am I a cancer or am I being a good teammate? If you're a leader or a captain on the team, I might have a private conversation with you about what you hear and how you're going to handle those situations. But we've talked about it over the course of the first three, four weeks, and then we can kind of revisit those things as we go. Uh, but I think that, that these three areas really help uh, getting your players on the same page when it comes to playing time and just being a good teammate, as well as your parents, because you don't have the kids going home to complain. Now, one thing I will add at the end here is parents see the game from a different perspective than you do. I've had parents come down after games. I've had them request to meet with me the next day. I tell my parents that I will meet with you. I'm happy to meet with all of you. This is the given night that I have to meet because I have family obligations. I have church obligations. I have work obligations. This is the night that I've set aside to make sure I meet with parents. Most parents have been pretty good with that. If it's an emergency or there's something that, that we really feel we need to meet about right away, then we do that. But having that one night usually gives a little bit of time to cool down. The other is I have a reason for everything that I'm doing. And if a player didn't play or a situation didn't allow somebody to be in the game for very long, I made that decision based upon what I had. And I'm okay talking with parents about that. But I like to do it on that given night. It's usually a day or two at least after a, a game. That way everybody kind of has a cooler head and we can come in. I also make it so that players need to be in those meetings. We can't talk about playing time. We can't talk about effort, about stats, about anything like that if the player isn't present. The only time that's not the case is if the player's uh, safety or their well-being is involved and we feel it would be best for the parent and I and the administration to meet and kind of team up and decide how to best help an athlete. And that has happened from time to time. But the majority of it, I'd say well over 90% of the meetings, are based on playing time and cooler heads prevail when we give them a little time just to relax about it. So. Coaches, I hope this helps you, gives you some ideas, gets the wheel spinning, how you can start the conversation before it gets blown out of proportion, before parents want to meet with you, because parents don't have to be the thing that drives you away from coaching or that makes it you know not fun to do anymore. Uh, we can't take away every issue. We can't take away every meeting. That's part of just be, having that relationship and the communication and the type of business that we're in. But we can do a good job of framing the conversation, the best way possible in these three ways I think will help you do it. All right, coaches, hopefully you got something out of it. And until next time, go out there and get your team better. Thanks.